I appreciate the invitation to be here today, and thanks to the, uh, to the ad tech folks. So I am in a precarious position here because I realize I'm the only thing standing between you and drinks. So I'm going to try to be concise and uh, deliver some value, hopefully. So when I was thinking about what to, um, what to talk about here today, I, I thought that there'd be two things that might be of, of value to you as the internet business develops here in India. Um, the first was I thought it might be helpful just to share with you what, what we're seeing from the Comscore data about dislocation trends that are occurring on the internet. I could stand up here probably for a few hours and talk about the changes that are occurring, but I wanted to pick some of the more important ones that are fundamentally altering the way that, that people are using the internet. The other thing I wanted to, um, and so that's state of the global internet. The other thing I wanted to talk about was what we've learned from the work that we've done now for just about a decade where we're looking at how online advertising works. And the reason that I hope that this is of value to you is that as you monetize the internet from an advertising perspective, I think it's beneficial to understand what's been learned in other countries that can be applied here in India about how online advertising works. And I'll give you one example. Um, in most countries, as the internet has developed, search advertising and direct response advertising was the first way that advertising dollars moved from traditional media. But then at some point, branding dollars came along. But to evaluate branding advertising, you need a completely different set of metrics. And there are different realities of branding advertising. And so I put together a, a, a number of things that we've learned about how advertising works that I hope will help you accelerate the movement of ad dollars to the internet. So I'm going to take you through two slides on Comscore, just show you who we are, for those of you who might not know who, uh, anything about the company. Then key trends in the global internet behavior. and four lessons learned about ad online advertising. One is the relevance or irrelevance of the click. The second is some issues about the cookie and the use of the cookie for delivering ads that you need to be aware of. The third is an emerging one, even in a developed market like the US, which is whether or not the ads were ever visible to the end user. Did the end user have the opportunity to see them? What we're finding there. And then because of the dislocation that Facebook represents and social networking represents, I want to show you some of the things that we've learned about how um, one can really leverage Facebook in, a, in, a, in an amazing manner uh, to the benefit of a brand. Okay, quickly, Comscore, we are a public company listed on the NASDAQ exchange in the US. We have approaching 2,000 clients uh, across the world and about 1,000 employees headquartered in Reston, Virginia. And we measure and report uh, internet activity in about 43 individual countries as well as global regions and, and the total world. Uh, we have, about two years ago, we entered the, um, the India market and it is, India is the fastest growing market for us in terms of, um, in terms of our own uh, revenue. So clearly, I think and I hope that shows that we're doing something right here in this market and we appreciate the support. The database that we use at Comscore, to show you on this slide, we have a panel, two million people around the world who have put our measurement software on their machines and given us permission to then use all the data that comes back from those machines. So we capture all of this information that's shown on the left here, all of the clickstream activity, search, advertising exposure, whether or not the ad was clicked on or not. We can run surveys against these people. A subset of the panel has our software running on their mobile devices, so we know how the mobile devices are used to um, communicate or to access the internet, uh, video, track all of that, and then we also have a measure of what's bought. So we track uh, e-commerce as well. And then we integrate that panel data with uh, data that we get directly from the servers um, of our clients, and we're getting that data from about a million domains around the world that represents about 80% of the top 100 global media properties. We put the two databases together and report back from that data information on what's happening online, size of audience, demographic characteristics, etc. And I, I will show you a little later uh, some of the differences you need to be aware of between what a website server is counting or what an ad server is counting versus what a panel counts, which is people. And there's a big, big difference between counting cookies, unique cookies, and counting 
people that I want to I distinguish for you. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, first at some data on what's happening um, on the internet. Uh, the US is no longer the center of the internet universe. And if you look what happened from 96 to 2011, we've gone from the US accounting for two thirds of all internet users to now only accounting for 13%. Not that it's declined in any way. Its growth has certainly slowed as it's kind of plateaued. But there's been explosive growth in the rest of the world. And on the right, we're showing how that internet population breaks out. Um, and you've got, uh, at this point, uh, the Asia PAC uh, area is the largest region, the largest set of internet users in total, with about 40% of the online population. Uh, being resident there. One of the things that's happening is that in emerging regions we're finding that um, things are developing faster than they did in the original internet countries like, like the US and one of the reasons is that, that in a number of companies there's a trend to skipping dial-up as an access method and going straight to broadband or going straight to mobile and that has a lot of benefits among which is, is an acceleration of the movement of, of ad dollars or an acceleration of e-commerce as the second major monetiza monetization aspect of, uh, of the internet. Okay, so that's what's happening in total. Um, if we break the data now into, into regions, the global population has grown, as you see here, by about 9% over the past 12 months. And in terms of people age 15 or over, there are approaching one and a half billion people online across the world. Um, the population's broken up uh, by region, the Asia PAC being the largest. The, the double digit growth is now occurring, as you'll see here, in, in the EMEA region, Middle East and Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia PAC. In Europe and North America, the growth in terms of total unique users has slowed. But what hasn't slowed is the engagement with the internet, the number of activities, and the time spent. So on a global basis, you've got more new users, as well as an increasing engagement and an increasing number of activities. Uh, one thing to be aware of is that in certain countries, India is an example, and then I listed some of the other uh, BRIC countries here, that uh, access is occurring from computers that individuals own, home and work computers, as well as from access points that would be shared computers, cyber cafes, internet cafes, and the like. And I thought you'd be interested in see how important that non-home, non-work component is in different countries. So for example, in China, there are a total of approaching a half a billion internet users, about 5% of them are accessing from shared computers. Uh, in India, our enumeration is showing that it's pretty equal with 45 or so million uh, people accessing the internet, again, from their own computers versus the same number approximately accessing from a shared computer. The internet audience in some individual BRIC countries, you can see the growth here, double digit growth uh, across the board, uh, the highest growth uh, occurring at the moment in, uh, in, in Brazil and Russia, but India at 12%, not far behind that 15%, China powering along at 13%, uh, you know, with, with by far the largest absolute number of, uh, of users at this point. If we ask, well, what are the demographics of these um, early adopters of the internet? Here I'm showing the worldwide, then the Asia Pac region, and then India at the bottom, and I've broken it out um, according to the age of the user. The important point here is that three quarters of the internet users in India are under the age of 35. And that's far in excess of the proportion in the world in total, which is about 52%, and the region is about 55%. And you do have a skew towards uh, males versus females, as, as one might expect. But the important point here is that I think it is inescapable now that as we go forward in time that the India internet population has to expand pretty dramatically because of the way that the demographic structure is set up. So as you've got that cohort of 15 to 35, as they get older, they're replaced by people who also are on the internet and you just get an expansion at, at a pretty dramatic clip of the total number of people using the internet. Uh, the users in, in, um, in India, in terms of total hours spent, 
are a little lighter than, uh, than the average for the world as a total, which is running at about 24 hours per person per month. And then I put some of the individual BRIC countries and some other countries here just so you can see a comparison. So India is running at about the same level as China, but is lower than the total engagement level that we are seeing in Russia uh, and Brazil. But if you look at the total time consumption spent on the internet by age group, again, you'll see evidence that we will continue to have explosive growth in total time spent, total number of users on the internet, because the domination of total minutes spent on the internet is coming from the 15 to 35 year old sectors and it's being driven by the fact that there are many more of them than the other age groups, as well as the fact that their engagement levels on a per person basis are somewhat higher. So again, it's really positive. As, as um, time goes by, inevitable that we will see an explosion in the number of internet users here. Okay, so that's a little overview of, of um, some, of the, some of the key demographic trends and total pop, online population trends. This is showing you what's happening with social, and the numbers are just, to me, just staggering. All right? So we now have, around the world, 1.2 billion people who visit a social networking site in a month, which is 82% of the world's online population. In India, 95% of the online population visits a social networking site in a month. Social networking is, is more than Facebook, although Facebook dominates, as we'll see. But if you look at the total size of, these, of the uh, social networking population, which is about, I said, about 1.2 billion users, that compares to instant messaging at about 450 million users globally, and then email, web-based email, at 917 or so. But what I'll show you is happening that is kind of staggering when you first see it, is that social networking is eating into a lot of the other more traditional activities that are occurring online, and it is really eating into the use of web-based email, especially among the younger segments. All right, the growth, if you look back to 2007, um, going through to 2011, the total global internet population grew by what? Grew by 88%. During that same period of time, the total number of people accessing social networking sites grew at twice that rate, at 174%. Now, is this for a stat? Almost one in every five minutes online today and now spent on social networking sites. Facebook is obviously the dominant player, but you've got LinkedIn, you've got Twitter, and you've got other, um, you've got uh, Google Plus, obviously, other social networking sites, some of different flavors. Uh, Facebook's worldwide site rank is now number three, so it's the third largest property, most visited property in the world. 55% of the global internet population will visit Facebook in a month. And its rank in, in India is that it's the second largest property. Within social networking, three in every four minutes that are spent doing social networking activities are spent on Facebook. And Facebook itself represents one in every seven minutes spent online. So just massive, massive numbers of people using Facebook and an incredible um, consumption of time that's occurring there. What did I highlight for you here, some of the changes that have occurred in rankings, and India um, plays a prominent role here because we're showing for individual countries when Facebook overtook the then current leader. And so back in the middle of 2010, Facebook overtook Orkut to become the largest social network uh, property in India. And you can see that that's happened in country after country. Not in every country in the world is Facebook number one, but in a lot of them, it uh, certainly is. It's not just Facebook that's uh, represented in social networking. We've got LinkedIn that's reaching in India about one in every eight online users. And then Twitter, um, who I think is still searching for the monetization uh, method. I think they're still trying to figure out the best way to generate advertising revenues. But 
they're doing that with an enormous number of users because it reaches one in every 12 online users in India and then one in every 10 internet users uh, worldwide will use that service on a monthly basis. Now, here's the change that's occurring as a result of the growth of, of, of social networking and its impact on instant messaging and email. So the way to read this data, we've got one, two, three, we've got five different age segments, 15 to 24, 25 to 34, and so on. And for each of them, each of those age sectors, we're showing the percent change over just one year in the time spent using instant messenger services, using email or social networking. And what you can see, first of all, is that you've got declines in engagement with web-based email and instant messaging that is occurring pretty much across all age sectors, but it's largest within the youngest age sector. And just to highlight it, within the 15 to 24 year old sector, clearly social networking activities are replacing uh, to a large degree the use of web-based email and the, way, and the use of instant messaging. The question that this kind of raises, and I guess it's, you know, it's not surprising when you look at the way that kids are multitasking and using different communication methods today, but the interesting question to ask here is that when the people in the youngest age sector get into the workforce, what will be the preferred method of communication in a work environment? Will they, in essence, revert back to email? Now, you know, exchange and the exchange service are not represented in, in web-based email, obviously, but an interesting question is whether we'll see a reversal back to um, the more traditional communication methods, digitally though they may be, um, once uh, the younger people get into, the, into the, the workforce. And that question, I think, is still open. Okay, so those are some of the, of the changes that I see occurring that I think are, are, are pretty significant, both in terms of the, the region, India, and uh, the way that social networking is having a profound impact on um, people's consumption and people's activities online. And I'll elaborate on that later point when we get to talking about Facebook and what it's doing to, uh, to advertising. But let me shift now to what we've learned about online advertising in terms of how you measure it and what its impact is both um, on people's behavior online as well as people's behavior offline. And I've got a number of different things, really four key points of learning that, that I'll share with you and show you the evidence underneath these. First of all, the click is at best an incomplete and at worst a misleading metric. And, and I'm referring you specifically here to display related ads. I'm not talking about search where the click is still a relevant metric. But if you're going to use the click to evaluate the effectiveness of display ads, I can almost guarantee you that you will not attract the branding ad dollars that um, we all want to see shift to the internet. Um, second, I'll show you the evidence that display advertising is both an efficient and effective way of building sales, and it can do that both in terms of e-commerce sales as well as um, sales in physical stores. Uh, the media plan, we're learning, or have learned a lot about the issues that are inherent in the use of the cookie to both deliver the ads as well as deliver targeted ads. I want to share, you, share that with you. Um, and then I want to show you uh, some really amazing stats on how this fan and friends of fan capability that's inherent in Facebook and some of the other social networks, you know, how that works to amplify the communication of a, of a brand's message, whether we're talking about earned media or whether we're talking about paid media. So let's take a look at, um, at these issues. Now, this is from the study that Brad referenced that we first presented um, at an iMedia conference back in the middle of 2007. What this is showing you is what, in the US, what percentage of all the internet users in the United States ever clicked on any ad in a month? So basically, in the middle of 2007, about a third of them clicked on an ad, on at least one ad. By the time we'd gone a year and a half later, the number of clickers had dropped to only 16%. So 16% of the entire online population in a month clicked on any ad, which means if you are optimizing against clicks, 
you are in essence ignoring 84% of internet users. And the demographics of these clickers are not the demographics that most advertisers would want to would target to. They tend to be um, younger, lower income, and for many advertisers, um, it's, it's not the preferred target segment. But you know, I guess maybe the more important point is that there are so few of them. Now, you might ask, well, so why is the click still used? It still is, by the way. I, I um, ran a survey against our entire um, um, uh, email list, which is about 40,000 different people across, uh, across the US and the rest of the world, and found that people were saying, whether it was agencies or publishers or advertisers, that the click was still used uh, by about a third of the respondents, always. And the only thing I can figure is that it's cheap, easy and fast to compute it. And ha old habits die hard and it's still being used. But look at this. This is, these are double click numbers and these now are the click rates on ads within individual campaigns. I don't know if you've ever seen these data before, but a lot of different countries you have highlighted India. So this says that within the average campaign running in India, the click rate on the ads is 0.19% which means that uh, somewhere around uh, somewhere around two in a thousand or so ads that are run um, in a campaign are clicked on. The average across the world is somewhere around 0.1%. And I think we'd all agree that if that's the metric of ad effectiveness and it's only occurring on one in every thousand ads, the conclusion is inescapable that the stuff isn't working. On the other hand, if you believe that it's not the relevant metric, then you need another way of, of doing it. And this is the way that we've done it across a, um, a number of different countries and we want to have this available here in India at some point. But we basically take the Comscore panel, we have permission from the people in the panel and the name, uh, to use their name and address to link to third-party databases. That third-party database could be something from a, another research company like an IRI or a Cannondale, or it could be the customer's own CRM database that has a name and address and a record of some buying activity. You match the databases up at the name and address level and you then have a single source database that tells you all of the online ad exposures or all of the online activities for that matter, and then the buying behavior that occurs offline. You can then take the exposed people, a balanced control group of unexposed people, and look at what their behavior changes are pre-post. Classic test versus control uh, analytical design. And we've done that. Uh, we've done it uh, to the tune of hundreds of studies. And it was first published in uh, the Journal of Advertising Research in the middle of 2009. The paper was called Wither the Click. Um, I was one of the, the two people that authored it. And basically what we showed is that even with these click rates running at 0.1% on average, if you looked at the behavior of people over time and measured the latency, you got a significant reaction from the campaign in terms of three or four key measures. It lifted site visitation. It lifted the number of trademark search queries or search queries using the brand name that was in the ads and it lifted both online and offline sales, even with click rates of 0.1%. Um, we then ran a correlation between the results that we saw and the click rates, and there really wasn't any, which said it's just not a predictive measure. And when we, when we did this for retailers, and I think we ran, he says you're about, a, we ran about 139 studies here for retailers where we're looking at the sales lift online and offline. And here I just wanted to show you the way that the design works. So we look at the lift, uh, in the exposed people, which is the light br blue line, and then the lift in the unexposed people and measure the difference and you know, you've got the lift that the, the advertising is generating. So exposure to these display ads, and display could be here, by the way, it could be banners, could be rich media, could be video. Let's call it display related. It lifted sales both in store as well as online. And, but the important point is that given that offline sales were much higher, the lift was five times higher, the absolute lift, in terms of, um, in terms of offline sales and e-commerce sales. 
So that was um, pretty important learning. And I, hope, and I hope that that'll be helpful for you as you try to um, attract more branding dollars um, onto the internet. Okay, the second thing I wanted to, to uh, focus on here is the cookie um, and where that cookie can lead you astray. First issue that happens is that cookies are deleted. I'll show you the evidence of how often that happens. Actually, show of hands, how many people delete their cookies in a month? Okay, so that's about, looks like about 20%. Uh, I'll come back to that number. Second is that the cookie you put on a browser is not a person identification when you come right down to it. I'll give you an example. If I access a website from my home computer and then the same website from a work computer, a cookie-based system will count me as two people when I'm really just one person. So you got an issue there of the translation from, from cookies to people. Um, and then this one at the bottom is a really recent one that I, I can almost guarantee will become a global issue very quickly, and that is whether the ads were ever visible to the end user. So were the, did the ads ever have the opportunity to be seen? And it's analogous to what, what's been known in television for years, which is be real careful about using the ratings on the show and assuming that that's the same rating as you'd get for the commercial. Because when the ad breaks come on, a lot of people aren't still physically in the room. And so you've got to make those adjustments for, um, yeah, for payment, for, for transparency, and for running all of your modeling as to what, um, what uh, impact of marketing plans are. So let's take a look at some of the data underlying this. All right? First thing we measured in the US was how many people are on an individual computer? Because again, the cookie is a browser identification, and you could have a cookie put on the machine when there was a man using it, and then later uh, an ad is targeted against that cookie, but it so happens that there's a woman on the computer, which can mess up the targeting. What we found in the US is that about two-thirds of the home users share a computer with other users. And so there's not a good translation from a cookie to an individual. I suspect, and I don't have the numbers, but I suspect that there are a lot of countries, and I would think India is one, where the number of users per computer is even higher than what we see here. So you've got to be really careful when you're using these cookies for targeting to understand um, whether or not you're reason, reaching the person that you intended. Also have some issues that I'll show you as to whether the cookie used for an ad server is really able to deliver the reach and the frequency that the media plan called for. Okay. So in the Comscore database, we don't use cookies to measure uh, the activities of people or account people. We're measuring it off of the software uh, itself. But we can measure over time how often cookies are being deleted. And we've done that now across the world. I want to show you the results for some of the countries. So the first two columns of numbers show you the percent deleting and how often that happens for ad server cookies. And then the two columns to the far right show you the same thing for the first party or the website cookies. And what you'll see, are these are electronically measured. This isn't survey based. This is actually looking at how many cookies were put on for the same website across time in a month. And what you'll see is that on average, somewhere around 30% of people are deleting their cookies in a month. And I just, you know, when I asked the show of hands, it's showing that here we got in this group about 20% deleting. And then the numbers are also showing here how often that deletion activity occurs. And it's anywhere between three to six or more times in a month. Every time the cookie is deleted, if that machine comes back to the website that put the cookie on, that website server is going to count it as a new visitor and increments the unique visitor count. And so cookies are not people. And that's one of the reasons why um, we at Comsco often have to go through an explanation of why maybe the Comsco people numbers don't match the, the server numbers. And putting the two databases together in the unified product that we have has certainly helped in, in that regard. But this is the reality that, that, that we have to deal with in terms of deletion. Now, what it, so let's take a look at what this causes. So here is here's a media plan that was cookie-based 
and it was targeted towards women age 15 to uh, age 35 to 54 okay so we counted within the Comscore panel we knew where the ads were falling and who was getting the ads and what the demographics were and was it a man versus a woman in the age and so we basically just counted the delivery so what we found was that 40 percent of the time there was a man on the computer receiving the woman ad 60 percent of the time it was correct it was women but the, when we looked at the age groups we found that only 43 percent of the women exposed to the campaign met the targeting criteria and in this particular campaign it meant that if you add it all up only a quarter of the exposed uh, consumers met the planned um, intent of, of this particular campaign so to address this issue what we and and some others have done is to assemble a real-time feedback to the advertiser and the agency of what's happening by publisher with the delivery of the campaign. And it's delivered in, real, in near real time. It's, it's like a, 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 there's a one day lag time. But what it allows the advertiser and the agency, the media planners to do is to change that plan on the fly as they identify where the ads are falling correctly versus places where the media plan delivery is out of whack. All right? And what it's caused and, and I, I suspect that this will, will happen here in India as well, is it's caused flexibility in the contracts between the publisher and the advertiser that allow for changes to be made if the delivery was not according to the parameters of that purchase. Okay, this is stuff that's relatively new. I'd say that all of this year has been developed within the past couple of years, but I think it's, it's, it's having now a profound impact on the way that, uh, that media plans are bought and then evaluated. Here's what, what can happen with, I'm still on cookies, here's what can happen with deletion, all right? So if you um, basically um, look at it and say, all right, so the ad server is delivering ads against a cookie and the cookies are getting deleted and it keeps thinking it's seeing a, a machine that's never gotten an ad before and it slaps another ad and another ad and another ad. This is the distribution that is not atypical if you would look at the number of exposures per person and then the percentage of people that are receiving each of these frequencies. All right? And what you typically get if you don't adjust for it is that you get a really, really large number of impressions delivered against a set of people who are just being oversaturated with ads. And so in this particular case, while only 13% of the people were getting 10 exposures or more, if you say, well, what percentage of the exposures was that? Two-thirds of the exposures were, go were going to people with an average of 27 exposures per person. And this is a real campaign, and it's not unusual to see this kind of a pattern. And again, it's what's led to the emergence of these real-time feedback systems that allow you to make adjustments on the fly and change things um, as needed. Okay, the third point I wanted to make is this visibility issue. And this, this is a, um, a really major uh, change in the way that the industry does, uh, does its business. But it, w what I found really interesting here is that in the U.S., three independent trade groups came up with an endorsement of this. And the three trade groups were the IAB, which is the publisher trade group, the ANA is the national advertiser trade group, and the four A's are the agency group. And they got together, hired Bain as a consulting company to do an evaluation of this whole ecosystem that ad online advertising was running around. Conclusions. We need to reduce the cost of doing business because this whole thing is getting way, way more complicated than it needs to be. They thought that a solution might be a single tag instead of having dozens and dozens of tags on a particular page. They wanted an improvement in the reporting of ad exposure along the lines of what I just showed you in the, in the, the prior slides. And then they wanted to bolster confidence that ads that are delivered are actually visible or had the opportunity to be seen. Okay? So this is coming from the three trade groups who between them basically account for all of the online ad spending in what is now a $30 billion digital advertising market in the US. Yes, this came out of, out of the US, but I, I just think that the principles underneath this 
are so fundamentally important that I can't imagine that this isn't going to be the way that the business operates um, around the world in the near future. Okay, so to show you the impact that this visibility issue had, um, we ran a study um, using, again, the ComScore panel and some other technology that we acquired, and we wanted to see the degree to which campaigns were delivering these ads in a manner that was viewable, whether the demos were correct, the geography was correct, was it in a brand safe environment or was it falling in content that the brand might find objectable, and then another issue was fraud. But I want to focus on the visibility issue here. So we ran 18 campaigns, counted them, it rep they represented 2 billion impressions, so that's a lot of advertising, it covered 400,000 websites, so this wasn't just premium properties, this was premium mid-tail and the tail. And here are some of the advertisers that participated in this, and you know, big, big names, obviously. And this is what we found. If we looked at the in-view ad rates, or the degree which the ad was ever seen, had the opportunity to be seen. I mean, it could be there, and the individual's eyes never focus on the ad, but was the opportunity to be seen there? Was it visible to the end user? And we found that on average, 31% of the ads were not visible. So, so this raises some interesting issues, right? It raised, one issue it raises is that the advertisers are saying, well, look, and the three trade groups are saying, I'm not going to pay for these ads if they weren't even visible in much the same way that advertisers say in television, well, if the rating on the ad that comes on during the ad break is dramatically different from the ratings of the show itself that the ads are running in, well, I want some adjustment made. It's also consistent with what in television um, occurs, at least in, at least, <laughs> I know this is true in the US, all right, where in the upfront buy, when at the beginning of the season, many of the advertisers make their commitments to the networks for their advertising dollars, they get a guarantee, which is that I'm selling you these number of impressions based on this audience at this price, and when the ads run, if you don't get that audience that I promised you, I'll give you make goods. I will run more impressions at no cost to you to make sure that you get what you paid for. And I am virtually certain that the reason that this initiative was endorsed by these three trade groups is because they know that if the digital world and the internet wants to attract branding dollars, they have to operate in a way that's consistent with more traditional media. I think that's, I think that's what's going on here. And so you will now see these metrics becoming available um, in, a, uh, in a broad sense. Okay, the last thing I wanted to, to show you, and I think that this, when I saw these results, um, I was, I was floored in a, in a real positive manner, all right? So here we're going to measure what happens when ads or any brand communication is disseminated to fans and then amplified out to, to friends. First of all, let me, let me show you this, because this is amazing in and of itself. In the United States, Facebook now accounts for 28% of all online display impressions that are run. So almost one in three ad impressions that are run in the US in, in, uh, in a very well-developed market are run on Facebook. Now, I'm not saying that Facebook represents 28% of all the ad dollars, because the issue there is you know, what are the CPMs that are being charged, and maybe they're not getting, you know, for their advertising, the same CPMs or Yahoo, whatever gets. But putting that aside, there's no question that they are accounting for a lot of, of, uh, of ad impressions. Now, there are number of ways that you can deliver ads or communications on Facebook, as you probably know, some of it you can pay for, some of it is earned, and you don't have to pay for it. So the, the, you can run ads. You pay Facebook and they'll run the ads. It's the ad exposed. You can run sponsored stories, which is where you pay Facebook to get a ranking that's high on the news feed of the individual. You can communicate through to friends of fans by going to the fans first. 
And fans, once you have them signed up, they have given you permission to put communications in their news feed. So one of the first questions is, well, if you got that permission, where should you put your communication to these fans? And the first thing we found is, don't put it on the fan page. Because once people have signed up as a fan, they don't go back there. All right, so here, example, Coca-Cola, Oreos, which is a cookie in the United States, and then Best Buy, a big consumer electronics retailer. There's a number of fans they have. Take Coca-Cola. When I, when I put this slide together, 24 million fans. How many people went back in a month to the fan page? Only 39,000. All right? So the message here is twofold. First of all, it's saying once somebody signs up as a fan, they, have given, they basically are friending you, in essence. And you have, as an advertiser, then permission to send them communications Put it in their news feed. Don't put it in the uh, fan homepage. Okay, the second thing is that you get a really dramatic amplification of, first of all, reach. I want to show you reach and then I'll show you persuasion. So we got three brands here. We got Southwest Airlines, big airline, New Age airline in, uh, in the US, Bing, search engine from Microsoft, and then Starbucks, the coffee chain. I broke the data into fans at the top and then friends of fans at the bottom. And we're looking how earned media or brand communications are getting disseminated to the fans and then to the friends of fans. So none of what I'm showing you here was paid for. Not one rupee was paid for by the advertisers in this particular case. This is just free communications. But look at, how, look at what happened with the reach. It was sent to fans, and there's the reach numbers, measured against the total online population. And then at the bottom is the number of friends that saw that communication coming from their friends who were fans. And basically, it's expanding the reach by an additional 33% um, to 86%. So you send a communication to fans, they will, not all of them, but some of them, will send out those communications to their friends, and you can blow out your reach at no cost to you, which is a pretty cool thing to have happen. But look at what happens with this persuasion. Let me explain to you how this chart works. So now we're looking at the three brands again. The first column in each set of three here is what's happening with the fans, and then the second column to the right is what's happening with the friends. The metric that we're looking at here is the likelihood of visiting the brand website compared to the average internet user. And what blew me away is that whether you're talking about fans, which you would expect to be, have an affinity with the brand and to have a, a higher than average likelihood of visiting the brand website, yeah, with Starbucks, they were four times more likely, Southwest three times more likely, and Bing 55% more likely. But it was also true, albeit to a lesser degree, for the friends of those fans. They also had, a, in every case, had a higher likelihood than the average internet user visiting the brand website. We have yet to see an exception to this across dozens of brands that we've looked at. Okay? Raises the question, well, why the heck is this happening? What's causing this to happen? As I said, certainly you can understand it with the fans. They put up their hands and said, I'm a fan, and so you'd expect them to have a higher likelihood of visiting the brand website or conducting a search query or buying the product. And we can measure each of those, each of those components. But why is that also true of friends? Uh, I have two hypotheses, and I'd welcome anybody having a, a third one. The first one is that maybe it's birds of a feather flock together. Right? So maybe the human reality here is that people who know each other, are friends with each other to some degree, associate with each other, maybe they do share some common characteristics, common preferences. And maybe that's one of the drivers here that's causing the friends to have this same affinity to the brand compared to the, the fans. I think that's probably true. But I suspect that for a marketer, this second hypothesis is the one that's really exciting. It's very likely that what we got happening here is that the friends are seeing their trusted friend, the fan, 
communicate their preference, and that has a persuasion impact, an amplification impact on their preferences. And basically it says that if you get from somebody that you know a recommendation on something, it's going to persuade you more than if that recommendation came straight from the brand itself. And I think that's one of the basic learnings that, that we've got here in this digital world. You know, to some degree, this may be, I was talking to Pete Blatchow, he was saying, maybe to some degree, this is really reflecting nothing more than what's always been a fundamental human reality, but we've got this reality now in an electronic manner that can just blow out this communication, you know, at a rate of speed, the likes of which we've never seen before. And I, and I suspect that, that is what's happening. The message here, I think, is twofold. First, it says, if you're a brand, build out as many fans as you can. And maybe you need to provide some incentive to get the fans, but just try to get the number of fans on Facebook or other social networks, for that matter, as large as possible. Because when you then communicate to those fans, you'll have an even bigger amplification effect, uh, both in terms of reach and persuasion that occurs. And I, I think you can tell from my enthusiasm as, my, as I'm talking about this, I was not paid by Facebook to say, to say this, but you know, as a, as, a, as a market researcher who's worked with a lot of data, I, can't, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen something as impressive as this, given the number of brands we've now looked at and the fact that we haven't yet seen um, an exception. So, my last slide, and then we'll take, uh, if we have time, uh, uh, some questions. Um, so, the digital world is expanding rapidly, still, but it's happening in two ways. You've got new users in certain regions. In other regions, the growth in number of uniques is slowed, but you've got all kinds of new activities that are increasing engagement and time spent. Uh, the perfect storm, really. Um, in India, younger consumers are leading the revolution here, especially got higher engagement coming from the 15 to 34 year old um, age segments and as I said, I think that just promises us that we'll continue to see explosive growth in the size of the internet community here in India for years to come. Social networking is a key driver of both PC and mobile activity. I, didn't, um, I could have spent time talking about the PC, I'll just give you one stat that I got from the Google folks today which is mind boggling in and of itself. All right. They are now activating, in a day, globally, 750,000 Android devices. Just think about that, the magnitude of that stat. In two days over the Christmas period, they activated 3.7 million devices in just two days. And just think of the impact that those devices are going to have on things like, well, how are we going to access social networking? It's pretty clear in the U.S. within the next couple of years, more people will access Facebook via a mobile device, then we'll access it through the, the fixed internet. Um, just one other dramatic change that these devices are having and that we're seeing playing out in, um, in the US, and this isn't necessarily positive for physical store retailers, who some of whom have described this as their worst nightmare. Somebody comes into the store, touches and feels the product, burns up salespeople's time, ready to buy, out comes their smartphone, scans the barcode on the product, the next thing you know, they're off on the internet and they're buying it at Amazon. And as one retailer said to me, describing it as his worst night nightmare, I never thought I'd be competing with the internet in my own store. And that's just fundamentally altering the, the way that just the world operates. I mean, it's causing stores to be downsized, smaller stores. So like, why build a store with warehousing space, if you will, in an expensive downtown location, use it as a showroom to the degree that Apple does it, you know, and then ship the product to the, to the customer. Maybe it's a very efficient way to go. Okay, online advertising, I think it's pretty clear it's effective. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, but both as a direct response strategy and as a branding strategy. And I think that's one of the key lessons here, that if you want to get, get those branding dollars, you have to talk in branding terms, and they're very different from, um, from direct response terms. And so my advice here for, for, for getting your fair share of advertising dollars is 
go beyond the click because it's just not the metric that's going to give you the credibility with the advertiser that, that you need. Uh, make sure that you're measuring the, 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 the plan, the actual delivery against what was intended. And by the way, the tools will get here to allow you to do this. I just want to kind of lay this out as where I think the, the, the world is going. And then Facebook, which is obviously here already in a big way, is, is pretty clear it's an efficient way to amplify reach and trusted persuasion. And just to kind of as icing on the cake here, to just give you what I think is a piece of evidence that this learning can really accelerate the trend. Let me give you what's happened now in the United States. All right? In last year, display advertising and search advertising in the United States, a well-developed market, grew in excess of 20%, each of them. Okay? And that's a market that's already at $24 billion. So you've got big growth. And it was pretty clear that the display advertising growth was coming from, from a movement of, uh, of the branding dollars. How big is 20% in the US? Well, consider that all measured media in the US is growing at 3% per year. So you've got online growing at a, a rate of about six to seven times the rate of traditional media. And I think one of the big reasons is that, look, search has always been the, the primary initial driver. But I think what's happened is that this learning that I've shown you today helps persuade the big brands that they should be moving some of their dollars over to the internet. So I hope that um, what, what, I, what I've shown you, I, I hope this is of value to you and um, you know, I hope that you'll be able to, um, to use this to your benefit. Mm -hmm.